Hello, everybody, and welcome to this latest Compassion in Politics live interview session. Uh, today, we are very, very uh, appreciative and lucky to have with us Baroness Ruth Hunt. Um, for those that don't know, Ruth was formerly the CEO of Stonewall from 2014 to 2019. Uh, in 2019, she was made a crossbench member of the House of Lords. She uh, is the editor of a book, the Book of Queer Prophets, uh, and she is now running her own consultancy, Deeds and Words. Welcome today, Ruth, and thank you very much for joining us. Nice to see you, Matt. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm going to start, I obviously had a list of questions of things that I wanted to get through and hopefully we will get through as many of them as we can. But as ever, events have slightly taken over and um, an announcement made this afternoon by the government about the Gender Recognition Act and rowing back from some of their previous pledges or what seemed to be going forwards with that with regards uh, the the amount of, of sort of medical support or medical examinations that uh, people had to go through in order to transition, uh, well they've they've rode back on those commitments. So I'm going to start there actually, if we can. And I just wanted to get first of all your reaction to announcement. Why do you think maybe that's happened? What's happened to change their position? And uh, where do campaigners go from here? Well, I th I think that um, we're in a very Different place now to the place we were in when the uh, consultation was started. So when the consultation was started, we had Theresa May as Prime Minister. Uh, we had Penny Morden was our Equalities Minister. Justine Greening had been Equalities Minister before then. And there was a very real enthusiasm to think about how some of our outdated legislation around uh, gender recognition, also some outdated legislation around um, LGB issues, actually could just be tidied up and reformed and I think that at that stage reform of the Gender Recognition Act seemed seemed very reasonable I think that uh, there was a recognition and an understanding then that the Gender Recognition Act process was something that not all trans people go through that it was something that most don't rely on in order to live their their day-to-day -day life and that the system was overly bureaucratic and uh, cumbersome and I think that what's been announced today recognises that. It says that the current system is not fit for purpose and more can be done to support trans people who are by and large living their lives as they want to and a certificate is very important to them. It didn't go further than that. It hasn't introduced primary legislation and I, um, I think we're in a very different position now than the position we were in when uh, Theresa May was in, in power. Uh, we now have a government that um, seems to not quite want to advance inclusion issues in, in all sorts of different areas. I mean, I think there's, there's lots of different concerns. The fact that we're, we're in a situation on COVID where people of colour are still disproportionately impacted, yet we still see series and series of white men talking about those policies. We don't have a government who is keen on advancing the equalities agenda. But I think discussions about Gender Recognition Act were um, overly simplified and minimised and heightened by all sorts of different cohorts. I think that, that people, people used it as a way to talk about much broader issues. And what emerged on that is that there is a significant vocal minority of people who have very strongly held objections to the rights of trans people. And I suspect that pre kind of 19, uh, 20, 2019, that was less articulated than it is now. So it's been a deeply distressing period for many, many trans people who've had to see um, a, a speculation and uh, critique of their entire legal basis come under attack and that was never the intention of Gender Recognition Act reform and I'm very pleased that the government hasn't announced any kind of pandering to to some of those statements so so it's been a tough period for trans people um, but in the middle of Brexit and Covid it comes as no surprise to me particularly with the current personnel that we don't have primary legislation at this stage. And, do, and are you, Ruth, obviously no longer CEO of Stonewall, but obviously still hugely involved in lots of those discussions. Do you, are you still having live conversations with ministers or civil servants about these kind of issues? Do you know where, what current thinking is there? Are there any sort of um, tidbits that you can offer us from your 
insights and knowledge yourself? Well, I, I don't think it's a, it's a secret. And of course, Nancy, who's the new CEO of Stonewall, is, is, is having those conversations on her own. But I think there is significant concern about the way in which uh, trans people have been discussed at this time, some of the vitriol, some of the, the lies, some of the misinformation, some of the hate mongering um, is of concern to everybody. I think there are lots of people on all sorts of the bench sides of the benches who think that what adults do in their own time and with their own power should be, they should left alone without, without this state intervention. I think people are also very concerned about the access to healthcare that exists for trans people and the way in which that healthcare is administered. But also I think the recent tribunal that has granted and acknowledged that people who are non-binary and gender fluid have protection under employment law is a massive step forward. So I think that there's, there's sort of several conversations going on really about how do we improve the lives of trans people in this country how do we ensure that they are protected and able to live their lives freely and what are the best mechanisms to do that gender recognition act is one of those elements and i think there still remains a big appetite for ensuring that trans people have the same rights and responsibilities that, that they do elsewhere britain really wants to be at the forefront of lgbt inclusion internationally with a host of um a, a conference that was supposed to be happening this year that would really cement ourselves in this post-Brexit time as the pioneers around LGBT inclusion. Nobody wants to lose that or that reputation. But I'm also very mindful of the fact that in 2004, we got the Civil Partnership Act, we wouldn't have got same-sex marriage then. These things take time, but it is my regret that uh, Stonewall uh, pre-2014 refused to make those advances, you know, refused to kind of start this journey. So we're starting in a different place on trans in terms of in terms of legal reform, yeah. because it became easier to ignore that rather than try and find common ground between the communities. And do you think do you think, Ruth, just on the, on the point that you were making about uh, people across the benches wanting Britain to be one of the leaders on LGBT plus rights is that something you see a genuine commitment for in the front bench of the current government as well as on the back benches i think the front bench is utterly preoccupied at the moment with a global pandemic um a no deal brexit and the rapid crashing of our economy around our ages where people die so it, it's not that um i think but i think there is a cultural hesitation around inclusion that we haven't seen for a long time you know john major tony blair it was a very different Different time getting through mm. legislation around sexual orientation at that time compared to now. Um, we are increased polarisation, culture wars prevail on all sorts of different issues. I was really struck by the story about the proms not doing um, uh, Rule Britannia and they weren't going to do Rule Britannia because you need a lot of voices and a lot of air being exchanged in the room. But suddenly the Prime Minister was commenting on that as a Black Lives Matter issue and it was never a Black Lives Matter issue. So there is, we are in a very toxic time um, in terms of how we think about all sorts of issues of inclusion. And I think that it's, I think trans has always been the canary in the coal mine on that internationally as well as in Britain. And, and I think there's a lot for us all to be concerned about. But generally the attitude in, in Parliament and, and in the Lords is that we are a progressive nation. and. Uh, and we should be at the forefront of that rather than trailing behind countries like Ireland, um, Scotland, uh, Argentina, Malta. You know, we shouldn't be on the back foot on some of these discussions. And I want to get on to soon how we can start to have those discussions and hopefully in a less toxic manner. Um, for everyone who's watching, we're going to start opening up um, the Q&A now. So please do post questions um, uh, there once it becomes available. Uh, obviously, we're, we're going to be talking about, you know, a range of different quite sensitive topics. So please do, as I'm sure you will, keep all your questions as respectful as possible. Um, I'm going to follow on from a thread that we've started, Ruth, which is about your time during Stonewall and the move to take Stonewall to a position where it was campaigning on trans rights. Did you at the time think it was going to be as difficult um, or shall I say, you know, controversial with those vocal minorities that opposed you and have done since? Um, and how did you tr navigate that with other personalities, senior personalities at Stonewall? 
Well, I, th I think that we were very clear and Stonewall had been under significant justifiable pressure from both individual donors, stakeholders, uh, campaigners, but also the organisations we worked with, the companies we worked with that were just baffled as to why Stonewall would not consider trans issues within LGB issues. It's internationally, it's LGBT, we were increasingly working internationally and uh, nations who were campaigning were saying, hold on a minute, why aren't you doing trans? Um, so I think it's easy to forget that certainly in the, in the lead up to 2014, Stonewall was really under considerable pressure to lend our considerable resource, knowledge, experience to support this cohort. And I um, have been thinking about and working on and investigating trans issues since 1998 you know I was in a all girls college and Jermaine Greer had just left because uh, a, a trans woman had been accepted into, into the college so so these these were not new issues and I think I had changed my my thinking because I think certainly in around 2004 Stonewall and someone like Press for Change kind of in that but by 2008 we were working with 300 companies plus we were really influencing in a different way it seemed um, dis dishonest of us to maintain the narrative that that trans people were better off on their own I think we were also very aware that if you are trans and people who are LGB experience hate crime in the same way experience discrimination in the same way and we have a lot in common there's more in common between us than, than divides us. So we knew uh, that there would be responses to that of people not, not wanting us to do that. We know that because certainly previous trustees on, on the board before I was CEO uh, had made it clear that Stonewall was not to be a trans organisation. Their families and their partners were very clear that Stonewall should not be a trans inclusive organisation. So we knew that it would not be universally accepted. But I think we were very clear that it was the right thing to do. We consulted with a significant number of people, diversity champions. Uh, we, we talked to any trans person who wanted to speak to us through a very long process of considering all the pros and cons and it was concluded that that we should absolutely there was some discussion at some point about whether stonewall should just be trans inclusive so where we do our work do trans trans work on top or whether stonewall should explicitly campaign for trans rights and and trans specific issues and the 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 majority response to that was yes we need stonewall campaigning in this space it's about to get really messy i think it's very easy to assume that um because this this emergence of this this backlash came at the time it did stonewall was in the right place at the right time to manage that and support it and i think that uh we we made mistakes of course but i think our commitment and wholehearted determination to campaign for what was right is is maintained today by nancy i mean i i left stonewall over a year and a half ago so i'm, I'm not as in the loop as i was but i think that it was the right thing to do then and it's the right thing to do now and i'm interested Ruth. so in some of those lessons in particular that you've mentioned what what are the lessons that you learned about having those conversations with people very difficult conversations perhaps about on, on issues where people would come at it with a very certain sense of what they thought was right and you might, might have to try and bring them along to a different perspective well that's always been stone business i mean ben, ben sonneskill did that before me and i i learned from the best you know talking to having conversations with people who disagree with you is is part and parcel of how Stonewall works and I think that during my time then and indeed my time now I mean last weekend I was having a conversation with someone who was in a different place on certain things is is part of the the influencing and part of the ways of working I think the crucial difference is that that can't be done on social media and no, it, it's just not even worth trying to do it on on social media and I think that that people conflate um exchanges of tweets um as discourse and it's not it's 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 not how it works so i think it, it also becomes very easy to reduce everybody to their lowest common denominator and reduce everybody's position to something more primitive than it is and i hope that i've always you know avoided doing that on, on social media really and where do you are there models where you've seen um those kind of conversations happen and work effectively i mean a sort of leading question there because we 
we're very obviously interested in citizens assemblies as a model something that's happened in ireland and work quite effectively it seems where people can have those sorts of um slightly less emotive but more opening yourself up to other possibilities come types of conversation but we're in a very toxic and divisive place at the moment in politics there's no doubt so i'm sort of wondering where what techniques we might use to um to move forwards well i, I think i think that uh nancy and and i in and all of us involved in stonewall have been having those conversations and that nudging but you, you just wouldn't necessarily see that from the from social media and i think that a lot of the conversations that have been had for example around prisons around sport around involvement of trans women in in different settings and in different circumstances are all part of those nuanced conversations but those conversations those citizens assemblies people have to come with good faith mm -hmm. and i think that part of part of the spirit of that reconciliation is that people are willing to to speak to each other with um, respect, mutual respect, with a capacity to to be willing to hear the other side. And I think that, that Stonewall does that very well, and I certainly do it a lot now. You just can't do it on Twitter. Where do you and, and where do you think some of this level of intense divisiveness that we um, seem to live in at the moment? And there's always obviously a tendency to say it's more divisive than it's ever been without necessarily um <laughs> without it necessarily being the case but um certainly a lot of the evidence about the way parliamentary debates carried out the language used and so forth does indicate that that is the case how have we got to where we are do you think i think i think that there's a real lack of um understandable boundaries about about what's acceptable to say and what isn't and i think some of the things that people say about other people uh is is well borderline libelous and etc um, etc cetera, et cetera. but i think there's something about the, the 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 blurring of the boundaries between what you might say around your dinner party uh with half a bottle of wine inside you and what you might say to someone in a professional context and i think that's that's heightened by the porous nature of our different roles at the moment and particularly working from home you know i i might close my computer down from a piece of work and, and go next door and watch brooklyn 99 but i might still be on my phone on on twitter so so me understanding where i need to draw the boundaries is important and i think that that's been lost a little bit i think there's also something about how um even the most uh nuanced uh, generous comment is routinely misinterpreted and misrepresented on social media and that's that's I think that social media is a toxic place for women regardless of where women stand on a whole range of different issues uh, and whether that's trans or abortion or you know any any number of different things if a woman has an opinion then how people will respond to her having that opinion will be more vicious than if a man has that opinion and we only need to see what happens to dawn butler what happens to diane abbott that the level of vitriol in response to their perceived um slight or their perceived wrongness is disproportionate and i and i think that that is something that we all need to be aware of and i know that i try very hard on social media just not to go there because because no good comes of it but we certainly uh, live in a time where that kind of behaviour has no sanctions and I think that is what what's uh, unusual at the moment. We have a, a, qu a great question in here from one of our listeners viewers. Um, do you think social media or the nature of television debate thinking specifically about people like uh, we've got a name here Piers Morgan um, are the biggest factors in toxifying or oversimplifying trans discussions in particular? Um, I think I think you could you could say trans, you could say anti-Semitism, you could say immigration. You could you know there are any number of issues where we keep reducing quite complex issues to its lowest common denominator, um, and Piers is merely a symptom of that appetite that we all have. I think I think that it requires considerable courage and bravery to be compassionate at the moment. I think I think that that demonstrating compassion is a controversial position for people to take and i and i think that there's something about that and what that says about us as a society that is 
that is deeply concerning. So Pierce doesn't worry me because Pierce is just reflecting what everybody else is lapping up. You know, that's kind of how it's going. But we like our we like our enemies. We like we like our baddies to be bad and we like our goodies to be perfect. And there's a kind of um, comfort in that narrative that means that everything I do and everything that I am is awful because you disagree with me on trans and everything that so and so does is awful and terrible because she takes a different position and it's simply it's simply unaccommodating to a civilized society to kind of keep existing on that plane I think. And we, um, we're going to move on to a couple to a slightly different topic soon but we do have some really great questions coming in so I'm going to try apologies I won't repeat them verbatim, but they are really brilliant. So I'm going to sort of slightly conflate them. A couple of people wanting to really get to grips with what your sort of proposals are on um, polarization on social media. How do we create better debate either on social media or how do we move debate off social media and have it somewhere else? Um, and somebody else asking whether you believe toxicity in politics is uh, more the responsibility of one side, left or right, of the other. I'm, one, I'm sort of have a sense of where you might go with that question, but I'll, I'll put it to you anyway. So there's those sort of two pinning you down on how we actually do create constructive debate, and then where are some of these problems coming from? Well, I mean, I, I think on the issue of constructive debate, it's it's how we how we live our lives. So I am meeting with people pretty much continually on all sorts of different subjects. I mean, at the moment, for example, uh, I volunteer at a local food bank. We need to raise 400,000 by next financial year in order to feed 600 people. We were feeding 50 people at the beginning of COVID. The conversations I'm having with people are about why should they fund a food bank when we should be eradicating food poverty these are difficult conversations so it's not like there's there's a there's a lack of capacity or willingness to have difficult conversations the problem is is that those difficult conversations are taking place and have always taken place but it's easy to pretend they're not so when you kind of say well you know Ruth, Ruth's not having those conversations it's like yeah, Ruth's been having these conversations all the time. Ruth's just not live tweeting them. Um, so there's a kind of, it, there's a lot, you have to kind of accept that people are trying their best to navigate quite difficult situations and, and conversations, I think. But I know that uh, certainly in the House of Lords that, that we are constantly talking about difficult issues. I mean, the, the current difficult issue is COVID restrictions and, and the extent to which government should have unilateral ability to introduce laws and regulations without parliamentary scrutiny the extent to which the government can announce breaking international law and what does that mean for those in the house of lords who are barristers and, and what does that mean about how they're going to vote yeah these these are difficult conversations and the capacity to have those difficult conversations has always been part and parcel of of how things work i think um and on and on the other question ruth i I have a feeling I know what you may say, but it was about whether there's more toxicity from one side or the other in politics, left or right. No, I don't think so. I think I think uh, I think that I there, there seems to be a consistent ability to reduce everybody to its lowest lowest common theme and give them a kicking, uh, regardless of where <laughs> they're coming from or their position. Thank you, thank you. Um, okay, so I'm going to come on to. Uh, Slightly, something slightly more personal uh, and I know one thing I love about having heard you speak before Ruth is that you can be very honest and frank but obviously I appreciate you um, how far you want to go on this is entirely up to you you've received um, through the work you did with Stonefall, Stonewall through other act activism you've done you have received a fair amount of uh, hateful horrible abuse on social media how do you feel when that happens and how do you respond what keeps you going because i would imagine uh having just been party to just a small amount and just promoting this event it would make me want to curl up and not engage anymore um so i'm really interested to hear what you do to keep going well i i, I think it comes down to what is social media and what is public life and what is what is real life and I, th I think that um, my day job and my job in the Lords and my volunteering is takes all my attention social media is a toxic platform and environment and I think that uh, battles are barely lost or won on social media they're just they're just a series of skirmishes I mean I'm lucky now that I have uh, a lot of um, additional support that monitors and intercepts things that are illegal 
uh, so things that are threatening to to my safety or the safety of my family, uh, which means I don't see as much of that as I used to, which is good. I also have a great person in my life who uh, monitors all the stuff that's libelous and kind of keeps saying to me, let's just let's just sue that person. And I'm, I'm not particularly interested. I think I think that Twitter is um, I keep it open because I still get messages from usually um, young lesbians going, where did you get your suits and can I come and see the Lords? So it kind of feels mean to kind of like just shut down that avenue, but maybe I could do a blog post about that or something. Um, there's, there's not an awful lot in social media, but I, I, I tend not to have much to do with it anymore. Um, you can normally see a tsunami as it's coming. It's usually trailed on Mumsnet uh, or trailed on on other well-known mm -hmm. blogs. So you kind, I get notification when when there's a tsunami coming, um, and I can kind of monitor my my tabs in a different way. I mean, I have no problem with people who want to talk about the issues, whether that's on, on anything really, but but the personal abuse is unacceptable. And if I'm getting it, then I know that trans people are getting it significantly worse. I know that people of colour are getting it significantly worse. And if it's acceptable to be personally offensive and attacking of me, what it's giving is license to the kind of hatred that comes towards other people as well. And it's not okay. Um, but it, it certainly doesn't knock me off my, knock me off my stand. I just mute and uh, <laughs> okay, leave it to someone else. And publish a blog on your suits, which I'd love yeah, to read. Maybe, maybe um, that's the answer. That's what's coming up next. Yeah. Um, we have had a couple more questions specifically on the abuse side, not about actually abuse directed towards you, but, um, sort of the back and forth that's happened recently with JK Rowling. I'm sort of hesitant to go there slightly, but I think the questions are getting to quite an interesting point, which is first of all, the response to JK Rowling's tweets um, and whether it's undermined the trans rights cause in that quite a lot of what seems to have been out there has been very personally attacking JK Rowling as well. Um, but also whether she has misread uh, the situation in the way that she's tried to communicate her views through Twitter. Well, J.K. Rowling's got the right to say whatever she wants and think whatever she wants. And I think it's, I think I'm surprised she used the platform of Twitter to do it. It seems, you know, she's, she's just, she has lots of ideas and thoughts. And I think that the, the hour long YouTube film of those two young people kind of dissecting her arguments was, was a really, positive and good way to do it. JK Rowling presents a series of arguments to smart young people who've got a lot of time go through and dissect those arguments. So I think that uh, JK Rowling has the right to say whatever she wants and people have the right to respond to that with, with reasoned and measured arguments. I don't think there is space for the kind of vitriol and hatred towards any woman on, on social media. But I think that goes all ways. And I think there kind of needs to be a, a ceasefire in the kind of personal abuse. And I know that there are people who would are uh, very um, unhappy about the personal abuse that JK Rowling uh, received, who happily like and retweet um, personal abuse that I received. So you, you kind of, you know, you've got, you've got to play it both ways. And I think that whether it's damaged the trans movement or whether JK Rowling wading into the debate has, has improved, people's understanding of trans rights and, and done more again you know we over over analyze the impact of social media on any of these things you know they they don't shift things as much as we think they do they let us feel quite secure in our own gang where we hear about what our own gang thinks actually when you map it back and map it across public attitudes the curve towards greater acceptance of trans people and non-binary people is going up. The knowledge and understanding of trans issues is going up. As that knowledge comes up, there is more backlash from certain quarters. That, that's to be expected. It's, it's what happens. Social media is not the thermometer for that. Um, do you think that, um, I mean, this is something that obviously you, you touched on the idea of the culture wars. Um, do you think that that is something that is as large, it looms large in public life as we think. Do you think it's something where there's people on Twitter who are sort of arguing across one another and the general public are in the middle and sort of not taking much notice? Or do you think, I mean, you, you mentioned the proms, that's something where it really did take hold. It was on the national, you know, people recognize the proms, it was on the front of the national newspapers. Or do you think it is a fairly small minority who are having these kind of cultural war debates? 
Well, I think I think the proms is a really interesting example because the proms didn't become headline news until the prime minister got involved in commenting on that. So, so the, the, these skirmishes that exist on Twitter, um, you know, Twitter is is a is a vast area of conspiracy theories. The damage, the response to removing rural Britannia from the proms, did it did was designed to wound the Black Lives Matter movement and, and has to be seen in, in that framework. You know, it, it was an, an anti-racist act by attributing a COVID response to maybe we can't all sing Royal Britannia to something about Black Lives Matter is, is it's just, it's, that's the problem. The problem is not, is Royal Britannia a hangover from imperialistic Britain's attempts to rule the waves when nobody flew aeroplanes and we thought that the only way to do things was by sea, um, is that problematic? That's an interesting discussion. That's not the problem. The problem is, is that that interesting discussion barely left the starting blocks before it was hijacked as something that was being demanded by black people of white people. That, that stokes difference, it fuels prejudice, and it fuels hatred. So it is, it is that that's problematic in the culture, so-called culture wars. And what that does is prompt people just not to go near it. So people just do not get involved because to stand up and say, actually, Royal Britannia is quite a problematic song and surely we can we can do something different. And by the way, did you know Jerusalem is a satire uh, rather than a, a tribute to Britain? So let's think about our anthems for a moment. That becomes impossible. So how much do people like you and me, Matt, watch these kind of storms unfold, watch these people being targeted and just not get involved? It's made bystanders of all of us. And and sometimes I get it, I get it in a small way, but nothing compared to Munro Burgoff, who's a black trans woman trying to navigate this space. So we all, it's made bystanders of all of us, this culture war, including, I would argue, the leadership of the Labour Party. You do not go there. You know, they, they will not go there because they do not want to engage in a culture war. And what does that say about where we're at? That is more of a concern, I think. But that's where we have to differentiate between the culture wars that are played out on Twitter and the culture wars that are played out on our streets. And that's where we have to be concerned about the prolific degrees of racism that are going on that are fueled by the anti-immigrant rhetoric, fueled by the anti-Rule Britannia rhetoric, etc. That that's what we need to be concerned about. How is this happening on our streets? And we know that trans hate crime gone up you know how is this happening how is this impacting on our communities should be the thing we're interested in i'm interested ruth in your specific take on the labor party's response actually one thing um i mean it was notable today that they were making a very big play about keir starmer uh trying to reclaim patriotism as a labor value particularly to win over the so-called red wall seats um now to some people uh that might seem like playing entirely i was also going to mention uh, that, yeah get some light in, light on the issue um that um playing into a frame that they can't win and that could only worsen uh the sense that people will in their heads be thinking oh it's all about britain it's about old traditional values and it doesn't move the conversation forwards others might be glad to see them doing it because they think that's why they lost northern seats do you have a perspective on their in on that intervention I, I don't to be honest mainly because i've been embroiled in the agriculture bill and and covid announcements today and, and the day job but i i think that what the labor party is trying to do is is tread a path of uh winning back those seats and and what they think is necessary to do that is quite interesting um and i and i think that the the unfurling of of the union jack is is not a very subtle way of indicating what it is they're trying to do whether it works or not i don't know and um uh deborah at britain thinks i'm sure will have have more insight into how you convert those red walls and being a crossbencher i am blessed in that i don't have to worry too much about about the different shenanigans but there is something about reclaiming that that kind of liberal voice who is holding that liberal voice at the moment um is is an important one you know I, i'm really struck by the fact that we still there's not really yet been a comprehensive national response to the fact that people of color are dying at greater rates from covid there has not been a national reflection that perhaps we can possibly have signing 
at the same time as our briefings now that maybe we can issue leaflets in Bengali rather than just English you know that there kind of hasn't been this collective lens placed on some of the inequalities that are affecting communities and society women are at home trying to juggle childcare and have just been asked to work from home again and the impact this will have on the women's role in the economy is significant and yet that isn't being played out in any of the narratives you know eat out to help out it's all this kind of jingoistic so there's something missing there's something missing from the political narrative that centers inequalities and centers how people are experiencing those inequalities from a feminist perspective from an anti-race perspective from a disability perspective and that's missing and I don't know who's providing that voice and I don't know who's going to start providing that voice and it concerns me that the assumption is it's better not to um, not to speak to those agendas in a way that hasn't been the case in the past. David Cameron would speak to those agendas. Theresa May would speak to those agendas. Whether you agreed or disagreed, they would still speak to those agendas. Um, and on that, we've had, a, we've had a question in really about who's going to stand, stand up and be counted on these issues, um, which is how can we encourage our politicians to actually stand up for their compassionate values rather than pander to populism? And I would, if the person who submits the question doesn't mind, I would add not just populism, but also, I think, to strictly just following the party line, which can also bring us into situations where those divisions get between the parties get wider and cross party cooperation is lessened. Well, I think it comes back to this, this observation that compassion requires significant bravery. You know, it, it takes it takes courage to consistently stand up and say, I disagree with you and I disagree with the methods in which you're employing to disagree with me. And I disagree with the way in which you are conducting yourselves in order to have these conversations. That requires principle, it requires um, a strong sense of values and it requires courage. And I think that politicians are understandably anxious about that level of exposure at the moment because of the way in which uh, those moments of compassion are hijacked by those who have a different agenda and I think it it is a deep shame and a deep um, problem about where we're at as a society that there simply cannot be the level of courtesy required that enables people to express different views. Do you think that I mean politicians we speak to often say that they feel like the debate in the Lords is, is much uh, more respectful than it is in the Commons. Do you from your experience, do you agree with that? And if so, what can we borrow uh, from the way things work in the Lords? I mean, by and large, I mean, with some notable exceptions, the Lords is a, is a very, very respectful space where people are allowed to disagree as adults and to raise different points. Expertise and perspectives and insights are very much respected, regardless of where you come from on the benches. And people take the time to listen and act with kindness. And one of the things that I've been really struck by, and, and one of the, you know, I am I'm obviously a lesbian. I present myself as a lesbian. My three piece suits and ties are unequivocal in my in my lesbian identity. And the kindness and inclusion that has been demonstrated by majority men in that space far exceeds the kind of inclusion and respect I can receive from other quarters that should be more accepting. Mm -hmm. So there's something very um, powerful about that respect that exists in the Lords that I think is more conducive to very clear disagreements at times on matters of policy. You know, th these are not, it's not that those, we have a Pollyanna-ish approach to making decisions and, and disagreeing with each other. But there is a fundamental basis of respect in those conversations that's very important. Um, I'm going to start to move us away now from uh, the specific sort of conversation about stars of debate that we've had and focus more on um, your time at Stonewall again. Um, one of the things that I wanted to pick up is the sense that during that, that time, but obviously leading up to it, you, um, society seemed to be becoming gradually more progressive and accepting in its approach to LGBT plus issues. How did that work play out for you in working with companies and institutions who might on the surface appear to basically want to play, uh, you know, do just do the face value work essentially in support of LGBT issues, 
but not really get to grips with the problems that uh, the that Stonewall wanted to grapple with. Well, the Stonewalls always run something called the Workplace Equality Index, and organisations that want to get get the points and get the prizes have to do the work. And uh, they the the work is is very clearly aligned to progress that's been taken. So, for example, I think now that the Workplace Equality Index um, asks for particular progress against against uh, much more um, inclusive policies around uh, race inclusion within LGBT networks and things like that. And that's been led by the very best performing companies. So the, the best performing companies set the pace and you just simply don't make it into the list if you can't. What's been really interesting over the last couple of years is how we extend that work internationally. And Nancy and her team have done a great job at um, bringing, bringing that index to India, bringing some of that work to other countries and using some of those tools to nudge and shift attitudes within, within those countries as well. Of course, the, the uh, index in India had to be trans inclusive from day one. It would, wouldn't have been countenanced any other way. So there's something about using those very rigorous mechanisms to assess progress that means it's quite hard to pinkwash. And generally what you find, and we saw it also with Black Lives Matter, there was a real difference between the organisations that made a generic statement that said, we believe Black Lives Matter, and those who said, here is my five point action plan, and here is my strategy, and this is what I'm going to do about it, and these are the things we've learned. So it's quite easy to differentiate between the two, I think, and Stonewall's been always uh, had a good nose for those who are just looking to, to cover themselves in rainbows and those who are actually doing the work. And do you think there is, I mean, one, I remember hearing you speak about the Rainbow Laces campaign uh, with the Premier League. Um, and the difficulty or the balance you had to play between that being very reaching an audience that you absolutely need to be able to reach against the fact that there are still currently no um, out, for the want of a better phrase, uh, male footballers. Um, what effect do you think a campaign like that was able to have where it was essentially uh it seems like it's sort of a very presentational thing but it obviously is speaking to such a deep rooted issue in sort of football culture well that that campaign started a relationship with premier league that i was able to develop into a quite a significant three-year partnership with the premier league where they undertook um quite complex pieces of work across the Premier League clubs to change policies, practices and procedures and attitudes. And therefore the decision to don rainbow laces became a symbol of that process in quite a powerful way. The act of deciding. I remember when I first started at Stonewall, there were similar debates about whether you should fly the rainbow flag. And the rainbow flag in and of itself was quite, um, you know, it didn't change the world, but the discussions, the process that organisations went through to decide to fly that flag was what's important. So the clubs who made the decisions to wear the laces, that, that's where it was important. And I think that we know from the fans and those who are, who are playing that it has a massive impact on how well people belong and their sense of relationship with the club. So I, I think it's, it's, a, it's work that we are... Um, that I was certainly immensely proud of when I was at Stone, and we remain proud of. I think it's a shame it doesn't get as much cut through as it used to. You know, in the old days, we used to be able to kind of get quite a lot of media cut through. It's, it's, it's more difficult to get media that are interested in that now. Is that, I mean, is that a positive though? Is it sort of saying that this is becoming, again, words are not that these aren't the best words, but mainstream, but more accepted? I think possibly, I think, I think that there's, um, in terms of sport, people want a player. And I think that puts immense pressure on an individual to kind of be the poster boy. And it would be a boy because, because of course, the women's team have grasped this nettle a long time ago. Yes. And they're very happy about it. it. It's a lot of pressure to put on one, one individual player. And that's, I think, what people are waiting for. And I think it, it comes down to that point of, you know, how much are people interested in process and nuance? You know, how much are people interested in, in the, the journey that people are on? So I think that... Um, I think people still want those headlines. Um, and a sort of another values based question, I guess, for you and how you've approached your work, your recent book, uh, the book of queer prophets, uh, explores the difficult relationship between faith, religion and sexuality. Um, I wondered if actually you, you'd be happy to give a sort of snippets <laughs> summary. I know obviously there's a lot of different writers have contributed to it, but 
what are some of the issues that people were bringing up um, and how they've lessons in how they've navigated them? Well, I, I think one of the um, things I was most struck by during my time at Stonewall is the assumption of the the disparity between faith communities and LGBT communities, and that that uh, that faith communities were the the cause of inequality against LGBT people and and in some cases that is the case I mean you can see who is funding some of the anti LGBT initiatives particularly some of the anti trans initiatives across the globe and and uh, Christian right money is definitely behind that um, but I think that there is there is a real there was there was a need to ch change the narrative about that a little bit and start having better conversations between people of faith and people who are LGBT and what what the book tried to do was illustrate that nothing is simply one thing you know it's my favorite quote from Virginia Woolf nothing is simply one thing and there's something about faith sexuality and gender identity that enables people to really explore some of those overlapping areas I think that um, the need to try and find a way through that and there are lots of churches, lots of individual faith schools, lots of communities who are finding a way through that and providing a space for LGBT people where they're welcome and, and included. But in Queer Prophets, there's lots of very sad stories as well, you know, stories of exclusion and the impact that cruelty and this kind of bullying behaviour has on individuals is, is deeply pervasive and says a lot about individual cultures and ways of working. And what, um, what, what of yourself have you been able to sort of explore in this book, Ruth? What's your, uh, how have you been able to navigate that difficult relationship? As someone who is a practicing Roman Catholic, I should say to introduce that question. Well, I, I am, and I and I think that it's interesting that the flack I get for being uh, pro-trans is is now nicely coupled with flack I get for being Christian as well which, see, which seems a strategic error as uh, those who are anti-trans are probably uh, there's a Venn diagram there somewhere best, best, yeah, not, must annoy, be. best not to annoy your Christian supporters uh, those who are who are anti-trans um, and I, I think that for me it was about trying to again pass that down you know the, these kind of these simplistic statements and assumptions about who people are and what they do just aren't helpful and I think some of the conversations I've been having with church leaders about how they can help um, really dismantle some of the toxicity in these culture wars, not just on LGBT issues, but generally, what is the role of some of our pastoral leaders in that? And I think for me, understanding the, the role I could play in some of those conversations was an important one. And so I, d I did it for a long time, but I think it became more um, acute when I was CEO, just simply because people listened more, they, they, they tended to listen more. And it, it seemed important to me. I was asked to do, um, when I left Stonewall, write the history of gay rights. You know, I've been working on it since I was a student, really. And I didn't want to do that. Instead, what I wanted to do was, was give a platform to people who are not generally heard, whose voices aren't, aren't part of the narrative, who aren't the loudest, who aren't the ones who just shout at people and shut them down, but actually kind of create a space where those conversations can take place. And, and presumably, as CEO of Stonewall, coming from the sort of cultural position that you did it I, I would imagine helped you engage with uh the catholic church and with the church of england um what were those conversations like what can you tell us what, what are you allowed to tell us about what what those sorts of discussions were were like well they were they were respectful and they created a space where people listened to each other where i was able to offer my views and opinions and be listened to and respected. I think there's something about how those discussions took place that are very important to reflect on uh, in terms of how we, how we talk about more difficult issues. So I think that certainly the conversations I continue to have and the conversations I've had over the last six, seven, eight years have been about, yes, some very difficult conversations about what does St. Paul mean in Acts chapter one, you know, what does, what does Leviticus's translation tell us about? What do we take from that? And also some really difficult conversations about individual identity and, and you know, where, where this strong sense of I and who I am sits across a more societal wide consideration of values and behaviors, which is kind of at the heart of um, Christian faith. So it's so quite knotty philosophical theological conversations but I think what has been in common with all of them whether they have been large group discussions or one-on-one -on -one, and most of them have been one-on-one -on -one and certainly not conducted is the is the sense of quiet 
between the people having those conversations and it's a very very slow process of change you know it's we're, we're a long way off any kind of radical change and i think the, the concern is the impact that has on international lgbt issues particularly in relation to um, countries like africa and how lgbt rights are being weaponized in certain countries in order to um, really demonstrate a stance on human rights that is much broader than lgbt issues um, and those those conversations were they ones where um, did Stonewall initiate them, or were they ones that the churches needed and already had decided that they wanted to have? Both. Um, I think I think there's there's been times when when we've written to people, and there's been times when people have written to us. There's times when you just have conversations because you're in the same place at the same time. I mean, certainly now, I'm in the Lords. I'm able to talk much more to bishops than I was before, and have very adult conversations about about difference and of course they have communities where they have trans parishioners and they have lgb parishioners and they you know they they are part of the society in which we live and so their questions are uh, more human i guess that you know there's a there's a connection to what people are rather than this kind of abstract notion of what theology t tells us it's actually talking about people and that that that's what's important really we're going to move on to sort of closing uh, future looking questions in a, in a moment. I've just got a, a couple that have come in uh, that I just wanted to put to you, Ruth. One is about um, diversity roles, actually. Um, uh, a question about whether you think, which I, I think, um, and the person may just want to clarify if I've got this wrong, but um, diversity roles, diversity and inclusion roles, I presume in business and workplaces, um, what value they have um, and have they made a difference to the way that businesses and individuals approach LGBT plus uh, issues and concerns? Yes, I mean, I think they can do if they're given the resources, the power, the responsibility and, and a position of influence within the organisation. I think too often those those roles are given to people as the answer to creating an inclusive workplace and those people aren't given the power they need and therefore they become kind of internal lobbyists trying to persuade the powers that be to do things rather than being given the resources the responsibility and the space to to really make meaningful change so i think investing in people to do this work always makes a difference as long as that's not a deferral of responsibility it's a partnership and i think we're seeing more and more organizations recognizing the importance of ensuring that responsibility for inclusion rests with the chief people officer or the person responsible for talent or the ceo and and that they as influencers within an organization have the power to drive that agenda forward so a combination is, is is what i would say but if you have got a diversity lead they do need to ensure that they have the power and responsibility they need to make make a difference great thank you okay we're on to the last um 100 meter sprint as it were um the if you were tomorrow you woke up and the uh you got the call and you were told that you were being made minister for equalities or hopefully one day maybe secretary of state who who could imagine for equalities what would be the one thing that you would want to get done in your time in office well I, I, you'd have to give me more than one Matt. okay how many do you need i think the first thing i would do is make sure that there are women and people of color on every body that is making decisions about covid right now i mean that just needs to be actively fitted that there are people of color and women on every single panel making a decision um i think the second thing i would do is is make sure that there is a root and branch um, examination of any new legislation coming out in relation to COVID and Brexit and its impact on women, people of colour, LGBT communities, disabled communities. That, that kind of lens is not being applied to these pretty major events and I know that sounds suitably dull and generic but actually it's it would be the thing that would transform and of course i would give proper due attention to the consultation responses to the gender recognition act reform and act on them uh, and and do that in a way that enables us to see some real progress and change for trans people um and then for those out there who might be in the world of campaigns or they might be wanting to get into campaigns uh, and make the world a better place generally what tips can you offer them either you know whether it's something personal about what you do in your day-to-day -day, or whether it's something sort of professional about how you manage to um, become increasingly senior in your in your roles and, and make a difference 
I think I think the most important thing is to find your purpose and not worry too much about the organization and the role but keep keep true to purpose so I think that I'm very clear that I want to ensure that those who are the most persecuted in society and left behind have the opportunity to thrive alongside everybody else we don't live in a society where that's possible barriers abound everywhere and I think it's about understanding you, how you can influence. And I think if I look at um, if I look at the food bank I'm working in at the moment, there's there's times when we, we we really struggle to get stock. You know, we need we need tins of meat, and there are times when I can go and buy some tins of meat, and there are other times when I can solidly campaign for an end to food poverty and the provision of universal credit to make sure that nobody needs to use food banks. My purpose is the same on both those levels. My capacity to do one or the other depends on what else I've got going on, but being true to your purpose makes a huge difference to what you're trying to achieve. I mean, on that, Ruth, I guess one thing that some, I certainly, for me personally, as someone who's worked in campaigns, you often grapple with is, do I put my energy where I can make uh, an immediate, but possibly small or sort of patching up change? Or do I spend my time on the big, picture and how do how do you approach that question i think i think it really depends on the resource your individual resource and your energy so f food banks are a really good example right so you know i i can buy more tins of meat and then i can try and persuade other people to buy more tins of meat then i could possibly take a strategic approach to sourcing tins of meat through a supplier where i can get it at a cheaper price my big response might be that i try and raise 400,000 so that we can always buy tins of meat but my real response is how can i end food poverty and those different things i can do consecutively and simultaneously but i don't can't always be campaigning for ending food poverty sometimes i've just got to go to the shop and get some tins of meat that will go out the door that night so understanding the combination of your own energy your own capacity and your own resilience and what can be achieved when is is key to try and kind of move these things forward but also things don't go in a straight line they come in fits and starts they they go backwards and forwards and sometimes you just have to take good care of yourself in that and and mm. keep keep yourself well in order to have a wider impact last thing then what are the things that you do to keep well uh, I turn off Twitter. <laughs> pretty, pretty key, um, and uh, and uh, learn to see what's what's really going on there. Um, I have the fortune of working with my partner now, so we we have a good time together. That's very good. I play with my gorgeous godchildren, and we build Lego, and uh, I swim and, and go running around our park. So, I try really hard to to turn the computer off at times and read some fantasy fiction involving dragons or something like that in order to to disrupt and do something differently because i think when we get overtired we get we, our capacity to cope with the kind of nonsense that we have to experience as women and as campaigners just gets too much really well it sounds wonderful and i will let you switch off your computer hopefully or maybe soon and go and read those dragon novels now um thank you so much ruth Thanks, for um Oh, and someone has just said they're waiting for the day when you'll be prime minister. So that's good. Um, uh, I presume that's directed to you. Um, uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your time, your wisdom, your insights. I know that you're incredibly busy. And yes, you also have a lot of emotional energies put into different places. So can't say enough how much we appreciate it. For everyone listening, um, Pre previously recorded podcasts are available on our website, compassioninpolitics.com. You can also sign up there for general updates about what we're doing, the campaigns we're involved in. Uh, and there will now be a monthly live interview of this type coming up and we'll be announcing who's up next very soon.